everybody. My name is Marie and I've got my colleague Louise here with us as well. Do you want to say hi, Louise? Hiya. How are you? Good morning, everyone. Well, thanks very much for joining us this morning. And um, thank you to Jenny and TechFest for inviting us along. So this morning, we're going to be showing you a video that's all about plastics in the marine environment. So I'm sure you're aware that plastic pollution is a really serious problem that the ocean is facing. Um, and so we just wanted to highlight some of the effects that plastic has on the marine environment. And so we started working with an ocean activist and skipper whose name is Emily Penn. So Emily is a lady and she'll tell you all about herself um, when she is giving the talk in the film uh, but she goes travels all around the world and talks about her experiences encountering plastic on um, sailing trips all around the world. So we'll hear all about that in the film and um, if you want to jot down questions or make a note of anything that you want to talk about afterwards then Louise and I will do our best to answer your questions. Okay? So, we're ready for the film. I'm pleased to be working with Macduff Marine Aquarium to help raise awareness around plastic pollution in our oceans. For me, my journey as an ocean advocate began rather surprisingly I actually decided that I wanted to train as an architect when I was at school and I went off to university to do just that. And it wasn't until I finished my degree that I lined up my first job as an architect in Australia. But I decided I wanted to get there from England without taking an aeroplane. So I ended up looking at that map, England to Australia, 14,000 nautical miles and I thought how am I going to get there and decided to try and hitchhike on a boat and that's when I came across a project called Earth Race, a boat that runs on 100% biofuel. I had broken the round the world speed record but was now about to go around the world a second time to visit 120 cities to talk to schools politicians and media about renewable energy. So I wrote to the skipper and I said, how do I get a job on board this boat? And he said, come to Brighton in South England and we'll see how you get on. And so I showed up in Brighton with enough stuff to last me for a weekend. And I didn't end up going home for another 923 days. So I got on board this amazing looking rocket ship style boat and off we went across the Atlantic Ocean, across through the Panama Canal and then into the Pacific. And we got welcomed into amazing remote communities. But there were so many things that I was never expecting to see on this trip around the world. And one was actually being woken in the night by the sound of something hitting the hull of our boat. And when I came up on deck, it turned out that we were surrounded by pieces of plastic. Now at the time, we were 800 miles from nearest land. So the closest people to us were actually in the space station in orbit above our heads. And yet there was this evidence of human life and waste in the most remote part of the Pacific. We stopped at remote islands and we found that the locals were struggling to catch fish because the commercial vessels had emptied their waters of the fish they knew how to catch. They were struggling to grow food in the ground because their rising sea levels had caused their soil to become so salty that their crops wouldn't grow. But the knock-on effect of this was a new reliance on importing packaged food and drink that all came wrapped up in this new strange material, plastic. And with nowhere for that plastic to go, it ended up getting dumped on beaches, thrown in the ocean, and sometimes burnt. And it was that really toxic burning smell that kept getting up my nose on all of these islands. And I wanted to know more about what it was. 
And I then learned about these chemicals that are released when you burn plastic in this way and how they can impact our bodies, our health, they can lead to cancer. And they're really chemicals that we and the kids living on this island in the South Pacific really didn't want inside our bodies. In between each of these islands, we had days, weeks, months of this open ocean. And we would sit on the roof of Earth Race, looking out at the curvature of the Earth on the horizon. And it was out here for me that things started to change. Because one of the things I love about being at sea is how you constantly have to react to the changes around you. So the wind changes direction or the waves start getting bigger and you have to adjust your sails, you shift your course. And sometimes your life depends on the response that you take. And it made me start thinking about my own course, my career. And I suddenly realized that I didn't want to go and be an architect and build buildings, but I actually wanted to tackle this issue of plastic that I was seeing everywhere I went. So I went back to this little island in Tonga and started to work on the ground on a waste management system. I got to know the locals to find out what they thought about all this plastic on their beaches. And I quickly discovered that they didn't even have a word in their language for rubbish or bin. The idea of throwing something away into a controlled system, it didn't exist because a banana peel, a coconut husk could be thrown on the ground with no consequence that it had never been thought of before. So it wasn't only infrastructure that these islands needed, but a whole new way of thinking about this new inorganic material. So after six months of working with the schools, we culminated in an enormous cleanup event. And we had 3,000 people, which was three quarters of the population, come together. And we picked up 56 tonnes of plastic in just five hours. Now that's probably enough to fill up a school gym. It's so much rubbish and it absolutely staggered me. I just couldn't believe it. And it was not only the domestic waste from the local people who were relying on this imported food, but it was also every morning when I walked along the beach, I was seeing plastic washing up. And when I picked up these pieces of plastic, I realized that the writing on the labels was in languages that I didn't even recognize. So this got me asking more questions. Where was that plastic coming from? And how is it ending up all the way on this little beach in the South Pacific? And so I started to learn more about the way that we use plastic and really the sheer volume of how much is produced and thrown away every day. Now this counter here shows the number of plastic bags that we're using in the world right now. That's how quickly it's going up. And those bags, they get used once, maybe twice, probably three times at best, and then they're thrown away. And that's the thing about plastic. It's an amazing material because it lasts forever. But we go and make things like plastic bags and water bottles that are designed to be used just once and then thrown away. And it's that mismatch of material science and product design that puts us in this situation of having huge amounts of waste material that no longer have any use or any value. So then I thought, couldn't we just recycle all of that plastic? Can't we turn it back into new things? But it turns out only 9% of the plastic that we use actually gets recycled. And that number is so low because plastic is a word that we give as a name to hundreds of different materials. And they all have different properties 
Some of them are stretchy, some are hard, they might be clear or coloured, but to give them all of those different properties, they need to have a different chemical structure. But when you recycle plastic, you can only take one type at a time to get a good quality product at the other end. So all this plastic, it needs to be cleaned and sorted. And then you come across something like a toothbrush that's got three or four different types of plastic stuck together into one object which makes it completely impossible to recycle. So all this waste with nowhere to go, lots of it goes to landfill, but a surprising amount of it escapes and it finds its way down streams, drains, rivers that ultimately run downhill to the ocean. When they get to the ocean, they then follow these ocean currents and end up in these hot spots around the world. We have five of these spots in our oceans and we call them gyres. And they are accumulation zones where because of those ocean currents, all of the plastic eventually ends up in the middle. Now, I was becoming increasingly intrigued with where this plastic was going and how it was moving around the planet. So after that project in Tonga in the Pacific, I decided to set off back to sea to try and find some answers to all of these unanswered questions. And so we set off to sail to the South Atlantic accumulation zone. We left Brazil heading towards Africa and we got out to the middle of this gyre, the place where we were expecting to find all of this plastic that we knew was leaving land. But what surprised us when we got there is actually it was beautiful and blue. We could see a piece of plastic here and another piece over there. We got our nets out on board and we started pulling up some pieces. And by the end of the first day, we had about 30 pieces of plastic piled on the boat. But it didn't make any sense because we know that 8 million tonnes of plastic is going into our ocean every year and we could only find these 30 pieces. Where was the rest of the plastic going? Now it turned out the plastic was there, we just couldn't see it. It was too small. So we built a manta trawl, a big piece of metal with wings like a manta ray and a net, a very fine mesh net off the back. And when we pulled that along the surface of the ocean and brought it back on board and turned it inside out, we found hundreds of tiny fragments of plastic, what we call microplastics. They're smaller than your little fingernail and they make up the majority of the plastic in the ocean. They're not biodegrading and they're not going back into the natural circle of life. When they get smaller from the UV rays of the sun and the wind and the waves, they're simply getting into smaller pieces that are much harder to see and much, much harder to clean up. When we bring the samples on board, we then analyse them and we try and work out what's plastic and what's plankton, the fish food that's floating on the surface of the ocean as well. And it turns out in this slide that these two pieces are actually plastic and they look almost identical to the plankton. So then we started catching fish and we found things like this rainbow runner that actually had 17 fragments of plastic inside its stomach, plastic that it had mistaken for food. So at this point we started asking more questions about how has that plastic got into the food chain and if we're at the top of that food chain, then what might it mean for the health of us as well? And so there's very little evidence that connects the bottom to the top of this food chain, but I thought I'd skip right to the end and actually find out which of these chemicals that we're finding in plastic and the ocean also might be inside my body. And when I had a blood test, we looked for 35 chemicals that are banned 
by the United Nations. And of those 35 chemicals, we found 29 of them inside my body. Now this I found really shocking. I think mostly because when we're talking about environmental problems, we're usually talking about something that's happening somewhere else, that we're watching on TV, that's maybe happening somewhere far away that's gonna affect us maybe in the future. But this test made me realize that actually already we have a chemical footprint, something that we will never get rid of. And at the moment, the levels of chemicals aren't alarmingly high that we need to be worried about our health, but it's a scary indicator of the direction that things are heading. So this sparked a whole new series of voyages for me called X Expedition, an all women sailing mission to look at plastic and toxic pollution in our ocean and also our bodies. And at the moment we are sailing around the world to understand really what plastic is out there in our ocean and where's it coming from so that we can stop it getting there in the first place. I want to share with you some clips of our sailing expedition across the North Pacific Gyre, which is better known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. We set sail with 14 women from Hawaii to sail to Vancouver, right through the heart of the Gyre. Here's a little of what we found when we got to Hawaii. Today we're on the east coast of Oahu and we're looking at what plastic is washing in. Oahu, one of the Hawaiian Islands, really sits on the edge of the North Pacific Gyre that we're going to be sailing to next week. Plastic on this beach, it literally could have come from anywhere across the Pacific. America, Canada, Asia. A lot of it is single-use plastic, a lot of containers. Right here we've got a toothbrush. We've got a couple of pieces here which are interesting. You'll actually see along here that there are some teeth marks. Today's been brilliant because it's the first day that our X Expedition North Pacific crew have all come together. The crew is made up from amazing women from all over the world. We have six different nationalities, but most importantly, a really diverse skill set. We have got journalists, artists, scientists, teachers, filmmakers, policymakers, and product designers. So people who can both look at the challenge, share that message, and also think about solving it. So we set off along the southerly shore of Oahu and we were in the shelter from the island. And then came the point when we turned the corner to feel the full brunt of the trade winds rushing across the Pacific. And the team on board were incredible. They came from all different skills and backgrounds, but not many of them were sailors. So the first week was a real challenge for everybody on board. And you can see how they were getting on 48 hours in. In the last 48 hours, we've had wind waves. Rocking and a rolling. The food has been delicious. Eaten a lot, slept a lot, and helmed a lot. Very wavy conditions last night. Gas have up to 40 knots. In a squall in the middle of the night. Full moon and stars. I've never been so afraid of drinking water. Not being sick, being sick. More sick than expected. Grew up in the wrong direction and got sick on my forehead. Challenges of trying to cook noodles at a 45 degree angle. I'm trying to use a little bit of a 45 degree angle. I think I've seen a turtle. I managed to cook some lunch in my underwear. I'm singing Fleetwood Mac up to my lungs. I really enjoy everyone here and their company makes me a kind of a release about that sickness. It's been wonderful. And we're almost heading in the right direction for the gyre. <laughs> so life living at 45 degrees was a huge challenge, but as you can see, the team dealt with it well with a lot of humor on board. But then on day six, the sun came up and we could see over the side of the boat and the mood on board really changed. We've been sailing through the North Pacific Gyre for seven days and we can't believe what we've seen. Plastic bottles, these brushes, plastic bags, buckets and barrels, a lot of rope, more pieces of rope, nylon rope, the constant stream of small bits of plastic, a cigarette lighter, fishing crates, micro 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 plastic. We saw one huge fishing net tied up together, seeing these beautiful dolphins and then chunks of plastic next to them. It's the sheer amount of pieces. It's literally a plastic soup, large plastic lids for containers, a washing basket, half a toilet seat. We saw a chair with all four legs. All 
these items once belonged to someone and they definitely don't belong in the ocean. This is that large net that you could see in that video and it always amazes me how the marine life then comes and congregates around it and the algae come and comes and attaches to the ropes and the other bits of plastic and then the little fish come to feed on that and that attracts the bigger fish and then the even bigger fish which is why Anna jumped in behind me on shark watch to check that nothing was lurking down there as we attach a satellite tracker to uh, this big piece of net. But as I mentioned earlier, the biggest problem is actually the smaller pieces. So here's a little bit of what we do around the work on microplastics. We're in the very middle of the North Pacific Gyre and when we look out at sea, it looks like a beautiful blue ocean. It's only when we put this trawl through the water with a very fine mesh net do we realise that actually most of what we're looking at right now is covered in these tiny fragments. We deploy the trawl for 30 minutes at a time and we're taking a tiny slice, just this wide for a mile, which just makes you wonder really how many are out here in this vast ocean. The samples we're collecting on board are gonna be used for a number of things. Some will go back to Hawaii Pacific University to be analyzed for the toxic chemicals that are adhering to the surface of the plastic. The rest of the samples are being analyzed right here on board Sea Dragon. We're looking at pellet, fragment, film, line, and foam. Once we work out what these plastics are, we can better understand where they're coming from and how to stop them getting into the ocean. And we now know that over five trillion fragments of plastic are floating on the surface of our ocean. And many times that have sunk to the depths in a place so deep that we can't even measure what's going on down there. And it makes us realise that trying to clean up this plastic mess is the most impossible challenge. And that right now our opportunity is to turn off the tap, to start at the source and stop any more plastic getting out there in the first place. And so all of our efforts are now focusing on land, working with individuals on changing mindsets, working with governments on changing policies and working with companies on developing new solutions and innovations that eliminate single-use plastic out of our supply chain. Thank you so much for listening to some of my adventures around the world. I hope that you've all been inspired to take action on plastic pollution and think about how you can use the power that you have to be part of solving this problem. The more I've worked on this issue, the more I've realised that there's not one solution to all of this. But the great news is there are hundreds and we need to be doing all of them, just one or two of them each, to be minimising the single use plastic that we all use every day and to maybe going beyond that to see how we can influence others and their plastic usage as well. Wow, that was really interesting. Um, we have some questions in already um, about what we've seen. So I'll just start at the top and let's uh, see what happens. Um, how many fish die from plastic pollution? Well, that's a really good question. Um, there's not an easy answer because it would be millions. Um, it's estimated that every year millions of animals are killed from plastic pollution. So that includes not only fish, but seabirds and marine mammals and sharks. Because all of these animals, they can become tangled in large pieces of plastic, like that big net we saw that Emily got in to try and put a tracker on to see what would happen. Um, and some of them will also eat bits of plastic, thinking that it's food. If you can imagine what a plastic bag floating might look like in the water. It resembles a jellyfish and lots of animals like sea turtles and species of sharks will eat jellyfish and so quite often they'll eat plastic bags thinking that they're 
bits of food. Um, and then, of course, plastic is can't be digested, so it blocks their system and it can lead to death or it can make them really ill. Um, and of course, then the microplastics are being eaten by the animals as well, and they just accumulate in their system. So lots and lots of animals are affected by the plastics in the sea. Are there microplastics in our drinking water? I hope not, but I suspect that's not the answer you're going <laughs> to... Yeah, unfortunately, as scary as it is, there there are microplastics uh, everywhere. So they're in the air we breathe, they're in the soil when we grow our food, they're in our drinking water, they are everywhere. There's no escaping microplastics. So that's one of the reasons why we have to think about how we use plastic and make some changes to try and cut down the amount of plastic that we're putting into the environment every year. How old is some of the plastic found? Well, plastic, as Emily mentioned, is forever. So the plastic that was first made, which would have been in the, well, originally, I think it was the 20s and 30s, they began making plastic, but it didn't really take off until the 50s. Um, and so all of the plastic ever made is still around. So however old that makes it, I'm not sure. My maths is not very good so early in the morning. <laughs> the first piece of plastic that was found was off the shores of Ireland and it was a plastic carrier bag and that was in 1965. So mm -hmm. they believe that the first plastic found in the oceans was um, 1965. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> Quite a while ago then, that must be about yeah. 50 years or so. Yeah. Um, how fine is a net used to collect microplastics? So that mesh net that they use, I don't know, that it has like a special technical term that it would have been measured in like nanometers, which is even smaller than a millimeter. So depending on, on the size of particles that they were trying to go for, it would be really, really fine mesh net, almost like um, just a fabric that you can't see through. So really, really fine. It's quite a difficult one to answer as well, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I can imagine it is. Are we eating the microplastics? Yeah, yes. it's estimated that the average diet will eat about eight grams of microplastics every year. So that's the same as eating about a credit card of Ooh. plastic. Yeah. <laughs> it like that. It's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. And regardless of your um, choice of diet, so regardless if you don't eat fish or if you only meat. eat vegetables or meat yeah. or whatever, um, microplastics can be found in everything from vegetables, seafood, meat, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, no, that is scary when you think of it like that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, Primary 5-6 from Glashyburn would like to know how many pieces of plastic are added to the ocean each day? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, as Emily mentioned there, it's 8 million tonnes of plastic, sorry, 80 million tonnes of plastic a year. So that's the same as a dump truck full of plastic every day. So if you can picture a, a huge dump truck, sorry, a minute, if you can picture a huge dump truck um, emptying into the ocean every single minute, that's how much plastic is going in. And that's based on estimates currently. And it's thought that if we don't make changes, that the amount of plastic will actually triple in the next 20 years. So that's why it's very important that we start making some changes, because if we don't, we're going to end up with more plastic than fish. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> don't really know what to say to that, do you? It's just, um, yeah. Why do people use so much plastic? I guess it's just because it's convenient, but yeah, it's, it's convenient, really durable, uh, mm -hmm. and it can be morphed into anything really. Um, plastic is not really our enemy because we will always need plastic throughout our life. However, our enemy is single-use plastic. So, for instance, water bottles or or plastic bags or um, perhaps toothbrushes and things like that. Things that we Packaging. do have. Al yeah, we do have alternatives to. For instance, there's a companies that's researching using seaweed um, in instead of plastic. So they're using um, seaweed, they're harvesting the uh, alginates out of it and um, making them into um, the equivalent of a single use plastic bottle that can be um, degradable as well. So there are things ar around the world or um, they use cornstarch and things like that as well, don't mm -hmm. they? Yeah, yeah. packing cornstarch. Yeah. yeah. So there are alternatives. It's just about making smarter choices moving forward. And it becoming more mainstream as well, I guess, because yeah. 
you know, you've got to be able to buy the stuff in the supermarket, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Is Emily Penn, the lady in the video, is she still on the expedition boat? Um, I don't know if she is currently, but last time I was in touch with her, it was towards the end of last year, and she was planning another sailing trip. The the triple expedition, um, they do quite a few sailing trips every year. Um, so I think if she's not at sea, then she would be planning another trip, yes. Uh, as she mentioned, they're also spending a lot of time just on um, awareness raising campaigns and working with policymakers and governments to try and change um, a policy because of course that's where the change on land is going to happen to try and turn off the tap and stop all of the pollution entering the oceans in the first place so that's where she's starting to focus her efforts more as well um how many rescued animals have been saved after or have survived plastic pollution um, I don't I don't really know that's a, a tricky one um, I can say that for sea turtles um, they're a good example because they do ingest a lot of plastic bags being that they um, think that they're jellyfish and that's one of their main food sources so quite often a lot of the research involving sea turtles and plastics um, for the the scientists to collect the information they do what's called um, a lavage so essentially they pump seawater down the sea turtles throat and it makes them throw up all of their stomach contents so they can check for plastic so in so doing that they help to flush the plastic out of the animal system so that's in a way saving them because it removes the plastic and it allows us then to know how much plastic is being consumed and unfortunately a recent study um, showed that a hundred percent of the sea turtles sampled in the North Atlantic had plastic in their stomach contents so every single sea turtle that they captured and and checked they did that lavage you did have some plastic in their stomach so um, a, a very very sad figure there but at least there is some help for those turtles because they're having their stomach cleared cleared <laughs> like a stomach pump <laughs> um, how far has the net traveled with the tracker device attached to it I think that was one we saw in the video oh. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually know. I, I didn't see um, the results from that. So that's a good question. I'll have to, to look into that and I can um, post the information if you like. I can email the individual schools if, if you want to let me know who sent that question in. I can look, at, look it up and send the answer. Cool, that'd be good. In fact, I'm going to just send it to everybody because it's one of those yeah. questions that we should yeah. know. <laughs> um, could the microplastics get so small that we can't catch them? Well, that's a worrying thought, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's difficult because um, they're quite small now. I mean, you know, there's fragments out there that are absolutely tiny, and that's what makes cleaning up microplastics so difficult. Is the fact that they're so so small. But there are the best minds in the world looking for solutions. So, for example, one of the solutions that people are looking at is actually using animals so mussels are filter feeders that remove the tiniest particles out of the water that's how they feed they take bits of plankton out of the water that would be about the same size as most of the microplastics and so the mussels will trap the microplastics in their bodies and then they can be removed from the environment that way so rather than just using live mussels to capture lots of microplastics they're looking at creating or mimicking the same feeding mechanism into a sort of a pump that will then trap the microplastics out of the water so there are solutions being example um being tested but at, it, it's still a work in progress at the minute i guess a lot of the fish have plastic in their stomachs then yeah yeah, yeah too many <laughs> majority i would say yeah that's sad um okay another question for you how much litter has been dumped into the sea compared to being blown by the wind that is a good question as well i would imagine that um it's it's not really differentiated in in that number that we were talking about in the um the truckload that goes in uh, every minute um because it's the same it's just not being disposed correctly is it so even if you put it far inland, you miss the bin or the bin is overflowing and the wind blows it away, eventually that rubbish is gonna end up in the sea because no matter how far inland you are, there's gonna be drains and sewers and rivers and streams and all of those places eventually lead to the ocean. So that's why it's really, really important to dispose of your rubbish 
correctly uh, wherever you are, because it doesn't matter how far you are from the sea, you can still affect the sea. Yes, yeah, so presumably land animals can be affected by this as well. Of course, yes. yeah. Yeah, they can mistake um, plastic for um, food and also because of the elements as well, it can um, turn car airbags, plastic bottles, etc. into microplastics, which then is absorbed into our agriculture. Um, so the chemicals itself would be eaten by animals. So birds would have plastic in them as well then? As yes, well as land animals. Um, seabirds, uh, as well as seabirds and uh, turtles are the ones that are mostly affected, the highest rate of affected um, animals um, for microplastics and to be killed by plastics. So it's supposed to be 100 million animals per year are affected by um, plastics and 100,000, I think it's every day or not or maybe uh, ends up dying. Oh, that's a shame. I guess that's not even the ones that are eating it, it's the ones that get tangled up in fishing nets and, and things right, like that yeah. as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, another question. How long do you think we could su survive if we don't start a change now? It's uh, Again, it's a really difficult question to answer. Um, we're only now beginning to look at the effects that the plastic in our diets have on our system. So early um, scientific evidence is proving that the chemicals that is released from plastic uh, as they're metabolized in our bodies uh, can mimic um, chemicals that our bodies make naturally. So hormones for growth and for reproduction. And so we don't really know how they're going to impact us you know it could be that our bodies adapt and um, we're absolutely fine or it could be that these chemicals begin to interfere with um, growth rates and reproduction rates and we'll see a decrease in fertility or you know it's just it's too early to tell how it's going to affect us and so we just need to make sure that we're doing as much as we can to, to minimize the problem because um, it could potentially be very, very serious. Okay, so somebody else asked if, if bamboo is a good alternative to plastic. Um, that's a, a tricky one. I, I think it's it's definitely better um, than plastic, being that it's a natural element. But again, with all of these things, you have to kind of look at the, the whole picture. So if the bamboo's grown sustainably, then yes, absolutely. But if they had to clear cut um, a natural forest environment to plant more bamboo crops and it's being done in an unsustainable way, then that's just adding another problem to the environment. So with everything and all of your alternatives, alternative solutions that you're looking at, it's exhausting, but it is necessary to do a little bit of research to make sure that the environmental impact is as minimum as possible. Makes sense. Um, somebody else asked if it's true that great white sharks are nearly all dead. <laughs> no, not, they're not um, nearly all dead. Uh, many, many shark species are endangered um, and that's because sharks have a really slow life cycle. So they take a really long time to grow up and then when they do have babies, they don't have a lot of babies. Like for example, the cod, the big fish that you see swimming over our shoulders all the time, they will have or, or, or produce about 8 million eggs every year. So that's, you know, loads of babies. Not all of them live, of course. Lots of them die because they're tiny, tiny little larvae. But it's still a huge amount of babies they're producing. Whereas a shark will have mm, maybe 20 to 40, depending on the species. So much, much lower numbers. Um, so if you're catching lots of sharks and fishing, uh, then obviously they don't recover the same way that cod can, which is why there's a, a much bigger cod fishery than there is a shark fishery. Uh, but great white sharks... Are, their numbers are, are lower than they would be normally because there's been lots of, of culling of sharks in many parts of the world, um, but they're not endangered yet. Good. <laughs> and here's a good question. Does the plastic that sinks to the bottom of the ocean kill plants? So presumably the seaweed and, and whatever's lying on the, the ocean floor. 
Um, it can do. It depends on how deep it, it, it sinks. Because in the deep ocean, there's no plants at the bottom because there's no sunlight to penetrate because it's too deep. The sunlight only penetrates down to about the first 20 meters in, in our coast. It can go deeper in tropical waters that are really clear. But you need to have the sunlight in order for the plants to live. Um, so if a large piece of plastic was to fall on a bit of kelp reef, let's say, um, it probably won't kill the kelp to be honest because the currents will keep it moving and so it wouldn't smother them um so i would think that most of the time the plants would be okay actually <laughs> that's good then that's yeah. positive to come out of all this and um, somebody's asking what their class could do to help the plastic problem that is a brilliant question. So there's lots of things that everybody can do. Um, and some of the easiest things that you can do is to make sure that you cut down on your single use plastic. So don't buy things that have lots of single use plastic. If they have excessive wrapping or packaging, try to avoid that. You take your own carrier bags when you go shopping, buy a reusable water bottle like this one, um, you know, other drinks cups and stuff just to reuse stuff as much as possible um, when you outgrow your clothes and your toys instead of binning them you can take them to charity shops or sell them on to somebody else and you can get used stuff as well um, to replace your old stuff so that you're helping to recycle clothing and toys and books and just to reuse and recycle as much as you possibly can that's that was a good question that one and um, somebody else is asking have more people joined the expedition boat um i think what they do is they they rotate people through of course they're, they're limited the the size of the crew by the size of the boat um but they have a lottery and they rotate people through because they like to have uh, a wide variety of talents on board so that people can take their experiences and enact solutions when they go back to their day jobs that makes sense. Um, how does the plastic get smaller? That's from Glassy Burn. Do you want to answer that one, Louise? <laughs> yep, no problem. Um, plastic gets smaller in the ocean just from um, the crashing of the waves, for instance. So you've got the tides, you've also got it rubbing up against rocks. So it's just basically the same as how um, sand is produced. So sand is made of um, small pieces of stones, rocks, shells, everything just gets ground together. Um, and this is how the plastic gets smaller as well. Okay, does the fishing industry collect any of the plastic? I'm guessing they'll pull some up in their nets. Yeah, they pull some up in their nets, yeah. And um, for and they do tend to keep the larger ones um, um, from a fishing family. And um, they tell me quite often that they pick up this, that or the next thing. So they try not to throw it back overboard and um, they try and keep it and then um, get rid of it the responsible way. Sorry, yeah. I, I had people here just now. <laughs> yeah, we, we're now open to the public, so we're going to have visitors appearing shortly. Um, there's also an initiative for fishermen to bring in any nets that they find. So if nets become lost at sea and other fishermen find those nets, they can bring them in and um, they there's like an initiative where they can hand those nets in to be recycled or they can repurpose them themselves. So fishermen do do a lot for the environment. Is the government doing anything about it? I'm guessing there, they probably are somewhere, but yeah. yeah. There, there's um. Well, I'm sure you are. I've heard about the ban on plastic straws, mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a, a ban on microbeads as well. That was quite recent. So I don't know if anybody's heard of microbeads, but um, they would be the face cleansers and soaps and things like that used to have these little plastic beads in to make them scrubby um, and that was a thing for quite a long time but of course they just go down the drains and end up in the sea so there was a recent um, ban on those because they're a, a big source of microplastics in the marine environment um, so they're now banned in the UK since 2009 um, but it's only in wash off products so lots of cosmetics um, like glitter nail polish is an example of a microplastic 
plastic glitter is a microplastic so any cosmetics that have glitter unless it's bio glitter is a, a polluting type of product um, so there's there is pressure and there's lots of petitions that are going around to put pressure on the government to do more so that's something that as a class you could do you could write a letter to your MP or you could write a letter to the government or you can sign a petition saying that you would like the government to ban microplastics from all cosmetics or there's um, another one that's moving forward um, that's just about the types of plastic that people can use in packaging so for example polystyrene is a really really nasty type of plastic because it can't be recycled anywhere easily and it also leaches chemicals that can cause cancer so it's one of the nastiest types of plastic that we still use today so it would be great if we could get the UK government to ban polystyrene so that's something that you can work on as a class you could write a letter to Parliament or you can just go on and sign a petition to help ban those sorts of materials cool um is it only plastic that are killing animals or is there other waste involved as well? Well, there's there's lots of other waste out there. Um, the plastics is one of the largest problems that the marine environment is facing just now. But I mean, it's not the only problem by any means. I'm sure everyone has also heard about um, global warming or global environmental change. Um, and that's another issue that's facing the animals. But um, the, the way that it works, the thing is, is that, you know, all of these little factors put stress on the animal. So if you can think about, uh, you know, an animal in the zoo uh, and think about they're living in a controlled environment, but suddenly if the temperature is too hot, they're under a bit of stress and they can cope with that. They'll be okay. They'll get used to the temperature being too hot. But then suddenly if you make it harder for them to find their food, now they're even more stressed because they have to work harder to find their food. They're feeling hotter. They're more tired and it begins to escalate. And that same thing happens in the environment. So all of these animals, animals can cope with a certain amount of stress. So as the temperature increases, if there's less oxygen, it's harder to find food, they're eating the wrong kind of food, there's plastic in their diet, all of these things are adding up and making it so much harder for these animals to make a living because the stress is just piling and piling on top of them until they get to a point where they can't cope anymore. So that's what we want to avoid. We want to take away some of the stress before we get to a point where system starts to collapse because it's just too much stress. How many companies actually use recyclable or recycled plastic then? I'm guessing um, quite a lot. We know quite a lot of the companies do. You know, some of the, I think it's one of the washing detergent ones that are on the, are advertising at the moment and on TV saying we use this as a recycled plastic container. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm guessing it gets more, more popular, but yeah. yeah. It's definitely it's, it's on the rise and it's important for us as consumers that we're, we help these companies out. So you buy these these companies, you take part, you make sure that you're supporting them and, and you choose the one that has recycled packaging or cardboard as opposed to plastic, that sort of thing. So that's how we as consumers, as people doing the shopping, we can exercise our power there and say, well, we choose this product because it's more environmentally friendly. And then that has a knock on effect because the other products that are less environmentally friendly will have decreased sales. So they'll have to make their changes as well to make sure that they are more environmentally friendly. So that's how as shoppers, you can control what's happening on a larger scale. OK, I've got a couple of is it true type questions. Is it true <laughs> okay. that we were plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050? And is it true that 46% of the rubbish in the ocean is fishnets? Okay, so the, the first one, um, that's been proposed as a model. So what scientists will do to predict what's going to happen in the future is they'll use computer programs to uh, simulate what will happen if things don't change so the more fish than more plastic than fish is based on a simulation with the amount of plastic that we currently put in the ocean increasing by 30 percent so that's the the target if things continue to go as they are then they're expecting a 30 percent increase of 
plastic rubbish in the oceans and then that will equate to more plastic than fish but that is assuming that we don't make changes so we want to make sure that we make changes so that that doesn't happen so that's why it's important for all of you guys out there to take the message away and try and and cut down on how much single-use plastic we're using and to make sure that all the plastic in your house goes to recycling instead of going into landfill and just little simple changes like that can impact that outcome so that hopefully in the next few years we'll start to see a decrease instead of an increase in the amount of plastic going into the environment. There's another topical question as well. Um, P6 at Glashburn want to know are disposable single-use masks and gloves making the situation worse? I'm guessing yes. that's probably a yes. <laughs> yes, unfortunately they are. Um, COVID related pollution is showing up in lots of environment, in lots of coastal environments. And of course it is, they're all plastic. So it's just adding to the problem. So unfortunately, yeah. I mean, if you can use reusable masks as much as possible, because um, it's, it's very much the best thing that you can do for the environment. Sorry, I skipped. There was the other true or false one was about um, the percentage of waste that fishing was net. fishing nets. Yes, um, did I think that one was in that Sea Spiracy documentary, and I don't think that that's accurate anymore. It might have been at one point in time, and I know there is a large amount of plastic that is, in fact, um, you know, nets that are lost at sea. But that number seems a bit high to me. The highest percentage of. Uh... Uh, trash plastic in the ocean is plastic bags plastic bags yeah that makes more sense and of course then just the microplastics yeah, yeah. Uh, okay another interesting question how deep does the plastic go down into the ocean it's been found in the absolute deepest parts of the ocean so it's everywhere uh, absolutely everywhere um they they don't go to the deepest parts of the ocean very often um but uh, um, the last time a submersible went into the bottom of the mariana's trench which is the deepest portion of the ocean they did find evidence of plastic there there was plastic bottles fishing crates um and, and just other plastic debris that they could show on the camera footage that they took Okay, I think um, there's a few people trying to leave now. I guess yeah. it's break time or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll make this the last question. Does your aquarium fish have microplastics in them? Would you Unfortunately, know? yes, they probably do. I mean, we have tested our water because our water comes from the ocean and we, we put it through a filter and we, we looked under the microscope to see if we could spot any microplastics. And we spotted very few, to be fair. There was very few that had come in. I think most of them does get stopped by our particulate filter. But chances are there's uh, there is still fish there because they're being fed other fish that are caught out in the ocean. So they would have microplastics in and they're still likely to be microplastics in the water here so um, I'm afraid there's probably not any fish anywhere in the world that don't have microplastics in as sad as it is that is very sad um, one of the questions sorry to interrupt one of the questions is if they put water underneath a microscope um, could you see microplastics well one of the experiments we do here quite regularly in the aquarium is we take some of the sand from the beach just outside our facility and we put it um, we put it through a filtration system and then we look at it underneath the microscope and even in this remote part of the of the world um, there is always pieces of microplastic um, in each sample that we take so every single sample we take uh, has got microplastics in it of some sort Wow, you just don't realise how yeah. widespread it is, but, but yeah, it's very close to home as well as being in the Pacific or, or you know, thousands of miles away. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. Okay, I, well, I think we'll have to stop there because I think I'm, I'm aware that people are, are heading out to break and things like that. Yeah. But thank you, ladies. That was fantastic. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'm sure if MD has got any burning questions that they really want answered, if they email them in to us and we can pass them on to you. And, Absolutely, um, or just get in touch with us directly. We're more than happy to help with questions at any time. Cool. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody, for joining us today. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.